and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, previously known here for Overwar, The Night Comes Down. Now coming to us with a horror brawler known as Deadbeats, the one and only Richard Kelly. How you doing today, man? Doing all right. Thank you for having me on the show. Thank you for coming back. So, this is a interest. This is an interesting beast with well, Deadbeats, which you are describing as horror brawler brawling in a bedeviled '90s. Um. There's a f there's a few names that I'm that in that ended up coming to mind when I saw that when I saw this that I was curious if they pl if they played a, a little bit of a um of a factor in terms of the inspiration. The big one, of course, is Hunter the Reckoning slash Vigil. Interesting. Uh so of the sort of idea soup that created this game hunter was not deliberately in the broth but it might have kind of snuck in there mm -hmm. uh games like hunter and delta green are almost in the same sort of space uh because you are you're like you're deliberately powerful people and you are finding and removing uh otherworldly influences from the mortal world um but i wasn't specifically trying to channel hunter uh, one of the things I think Hunter is really good at is a sort of gloomy, bluesy, sort of meditative approach to monster hunting. And Deadbeats is go, 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 in your face, uh, like air juggle combo, uh, in, rush down. It, in that case... it wants to be a fighting game. It wants to be Devil May Cry. It wants to be um, like a side-scrolling brawler, like a double dragon kind of thing. Um, in that case, it's, I suppose it's a little bit. I should have also I should have also referenced Unknown Armies. Another really good game that also I wasn't really thinking about while I was working on it. I I dig Unknown Armies as well. I think its approach to magic is very clever. Um, it just wasn't in my head while I was working on the project. Yeah. The stuff that I was pulling from was Devil May Cry, uh, Evil Dead, Chainsaw Man, Jujutsu Kaisen. Um, and the original form of the engine, uh, came from a game called Rotten Stars that I wrote in response to playing and experiencing Callisto Protocol. Um, which, so, yeah, which I will, I will be honest, I did not enjoy Callisto Protocol that much, um, and I was so frustrated by this game that I, uh, by uh, that game that I wrote a 50-page uh, system called Rotten Stars. And then, as I was testing Rotten Stars, I realized if I just tweaked a few of the survival horror elements, I'd get action horror instead. And that's that's how Dead Beats came to be. And you know, what's the, you know, what's the biggest problem with Callisto Protocol? <laughs> that the dead it's got a few. <laughs> I was about I was I was about to say I should have said, I should have said a, a lot how much time you got but but the one I wanted to go with is that the Dead Space remake came out the same month. Yeah, that did not help it. Um, also, There's... I think it was originally supposed to fit in the lore of PUBG. Yeah, and that got canceled late in development, so it affected the story. It had an interesting idea locked in the heart of it, which is a uh, 3D third-person horror brawler, and I like that mashup of genres. Um, and I liked it enough to try and dig out the core of that idea from inside the damp carcass of Callisto Protocol and turn it into a separate RPG. So you know what um, would make good ref. You know what would make if you're. Leaning into that idea of horror of horror brawler, you know it would would make a very good um very good frame very good frame of reference to steal some ideas from. Even uh, condemned. Breakdown. Oh, don't know if I know that one. 
Breakdown was a hidden gem on the original Xbox. Um, it was one of it was an early adopter of the you're constantly in first person perspective kind of um, thinking. It places a lot of emphasis on on its hand to hand, despite being in first person, which is why I laugh when um, fa when fans of the Elder Scrolls tell me that you can't do good melee combat in first person. That's bullshit. Yeah, I've seen no, it done. There's there's good examples. Uh, Xenoclash is another uh, another Z first person brawl that pulls it off. Which um, recently got a sequel. Yep. Um, Machen X way back on the Dreamcast. Yep. Um and King and um Kingdom Come. Which oh, is getting I don't a know if I that one either. Kingdom Come Deliverance. Oh yes, okay, yeah, I I am familiar with that. Uh, and there's pro there's probably uh, there's probably a handful of others. There's also the there's also the fact that um game games like Fear managed to have some pretty good melee, and Fear's one of my favorite shooters of that era. Oh. Um, yeah. It can it can be it can be done is what is what I'm saying. Um, although if, although um, there's a small part of me that that thinks that Callisto Protocol should have taken some notes from God Hand just to be a massive troll. <laughs> I mean, uh, God Hand uh, for all of its its design choices, it definitely achieves something, and I I think Callisto Protocol is kind of the same way. I don't want to be too hard on it because it did try something different and that that thing that it tried was ultimately compelling even if it didn't stick the landing it, it was a case of it too many cooks me, in the kitchen for example ah uh, yes <laughs> that may be true uh, it, it compelled me to make rotten stars and then to use rotten stars to make dead beats mm -hmm. nah, and for me personally one of the th one of the things that drew my attention aside from the brawler aspect aside from the fact that i've but I have been looking around to to find a, to find some sort of game if I don't want to. I'd say I'd say make it myself, but I'm kind of occupied on that front of yep. a, of a game that is trying to channel that that brawling that that um combat style. And while there there are ones that do that do so when it comes to fighting games, like when it comes to straight up 2D fighting games, like say Fight or Turbo or Musha Shugyo. When it comes yep. to that sort of stylish combo work that we see that we see in character action games, we haven't really had an equivalent except maybe Abyss, but that one's on kind of the framework of the of Powered by the Apocalypse, so it's kind of bottlenecked in what it can do on that front. Um, yeah. The only other one I can think of is maybe all of their strengths, which isn't really do which isn't really doing that. So it's there's yeah, a, there's a it's, whole lot of close but not quite. Yeah, and it's hard to evoke something like a side-scrolling brawler in tabletop because a lot of what makes a side-scrolling brawler work is that it's very immediate and visceral. And if you're you're stopping every couple of seconds to roll the die to check if a punch lands, that feels different. That feels slower. That feels wargamey. Um, so one of the, the challenges that I wrestled with while I was coming up with the engine was how do I make this as tactile as possible without, you know, having like a fist fight at the table. Not that that wouldn't be entertaining. It I it would certainly be something. Uh, you'd get uh, unprecedented levels of immersion in the game. But uh, the way I solved that problem for Deadbeats was to go with sort of a yes as a default when I was writing mechanics. If a player attacks someone, as long as that target is within range, the attack just hits. Like, you don't you don't roll to see if attacks land, they land. Uh, the only time something might miss is if a player is being attacked by an enemy, and then the player has options to try and avoid or block that attack. Mm -hmm. Um it's it's built around trying to avoid interrupting the player as as much as possible. Yeah, and I've often argued that um, cards as a primary mechanic is a, a a setup with a lot of untapped potential. Yep. And 
Yeah, so Deadbeats uses a deck of cards instead of a die, but it uses them in sort of the same way you'd use a d20. You mm -hmm. pull a card, you add your stat, um, you compare it against the target number to pass a check. Mm -hmm. Uh, you use it in combat also to extend your turn. Um, and this goes lightning fast. You can pull cards faster than you can roll and catch a die. Um, and you get more information on each card than you do on a single face of the die. Like you roll a d20, it says a 20. That's all the information you have. You pull a card, you get the king of spades, you know that this is a king, you know that this is a black king, um, and you know that it's a spades king. That's three different pieces of information you can build mechanics off of. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with, that in, with that in mind, are you go since you're using the whole, draw, the whole draw card thing, are you going aim high or aim low? Uh, it is aim high. Um, you're generally looking in the current version. Uh, in combat, you're looking for a 10 or higher to continue your turn. And out of combat, I'm still sort of fine-tuning the difficulty there. Um, I'm not I'm not committed to anything yet, but I think it's roughly around a 12 out of combat right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Face cards are uh, jack is 11, queen is 12, king is 13, joker is 20, and ace is 1. So this very much is a ca is a case of um, aces low instead of aces high. Aces low most of the time because the other thing the deck of cards let me do was include deck building in character building. Uh, there are certain upgrades that any character can take that let you mark cards in your deck that let you change the value of certain cards, that let you add additional types of cards to your deck. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can customize your d20, for, for want of a better comparison, uh, as part of customizing your character. Right, that, may, that certainly makes sense. And... Because in the, in the core mechanics, you talk, you talk about how as you try and as, that um the action the action economy is built around fatigue. You the more yep. the more you pull, the more you get fatigue. The harder it is for you to chain, you get you get it back. So is is managing fatigue the game's equivalent to its action economy? Yes, kind of. Um, the. When I do combat in tabletop RPGs, the thing that I like the most is being able to take 20 actions during your turn. It, it feels frustrating to get maybe one or two actions, swing twice, miss both times, your turn ends, and you have to wait another five minutes for it to cycle back around again. So with Deadbeats, every time you take an action in combat, you pull a card, uh, you add your stat to see if you get another action as part of that chain. Um, each time you succeed in getting your action back, you take a point of fatigue, which reduces the number on your card on future pulls. And those fatigue last until the end of the round. They basically wash away when your turn finishes. Um, but they make it harder to build uh, combos as you keep chaining actions together. By the time you've pulled three cards, you've got three fatigue. Uh, the numbers on your cards are six points lower than they should be. It gets much easier to miss that target number. Mm -hmm. um, do suits play? A, do suit draws play a factor in results? In some specific mechanics, yes. But in a general card pull, the the suit or the color isn't necessarily going to matter. Mm -hmm. uh, some some monster abilities key off of different suits or off of different colors, and I think there are some player abilities in the current build that do that as well. Mm -hmm. So, given that um, attacks always hit, how how do you, how does one, how does a character mitigate damage? Yep. So, uh, if you are a, an enemy, if you are a monster in a combat, uh, you don't. You just get hit. If you are a player character, the way it works is 
uh, you pull a card from the deck, you look at the card, and then you decide whether to stand or fold. If you stand, the attacking monster pulls a card, and if its card is higher, it hits you and deals extra damage. If its card is lower, you dodge the attack entirely. So you have a somewhat risky dodge that you can choose to make based on how confident you are in the card that you pulled. Um, if you don't stand, you fold. And when you fold, you do automatically get hit by the attack, but you reduce the damage. So if you see your card, you don't think it's particularly high, you're not confident in yourself, you can always fold and just go for pure mitigation. And there are different upgrades you can take um, that make it easier to dodge, such as by redrawing your card or that make your folds stronger, such as by reducing the damage you take by a, a bigger amount, or letting you counterattack when you fold, or something else like that. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can certainly get to that. Um, and, it, and it does tie into something that I am very fond of in, in RPG design, and that is risk-reward. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the... The way the turn actions work, it's a very push-your-luck kind of system. Mm -hmm. um, and the uh, the dodges are very much a, a measure of how confident you are as a player. Um, and again, there's lots of ways to tip the odds on those things. There's upgrades that let you redraw cards. Um, there's upgrades that let you basically uh, ignore a, a failed uh, dodge. Uh, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And there's also, um, apart from just the action economy, there's also a couple of resources that you manage during combat called Fury and Evasion. Uh, Fury is your initiative, and you can spend your initiative to add it to the value on a card to determine if you get to keep taking actions. So if you're willing to go last in the next round, uh, you can spend a bunch of Fury to get more actions this round. And evasion, um, in a, a different way, uh, evasion is whether or not enemies can hit you. Uh, if they have a range on their attack that's greater than your evasion, they can target you. If they don't, they have to remove your evasion first uh, before they can even attack. So there's, there's a lot of different ways to try and mitigate damage. One of them is just to stack a bunch of evasion and make it hard for enemies to remove it. I can I can see I can see that now. There's four main attributes that you ha that you have set up: callousness, hatred, instinct, and reason. Um, what yep. would each of those contribute to, especially in a in a combat heavy game like this? Yep. So all of them have one main thing that they do, and then all of them uh, also can be used in certain ways depending on what upgrades you take, um, and also in very specific ways in combat. Uh, so to give an example, callousness determines your hit points. Um, you can also use it uh, when you get downed in combat. Uh, a certain number of times based on your callousness, you can just slap the mat and get back up with one hit point. Um, and uh, there is a special action that you can use a limited number of times per combat with callousness to recover hit points. Uh, healing is pretty scarce in deadbeats. You get a free refill at the end of every fight, um, but during combat healing is hard to come by, and having good callousness is one way to get that healing. Uh, hatred affects your starting fury. Um, you get a refill on your Fury and Evasion whenever combat starts, and one of the big things Hatred does is determine that starting Fury. It also affects the damage scaling on some of your weapons. Uh, like in Bloodborne, uh, weapons can scale off of your stats, uh, and having high Hatred uh, benefits you in that regards. Um, it also has a unique action, like, uh, like Callousness does. Um, your instinct is used primarily for chaining actions together in combat. Um, the instinct is added to the card you draw to determine if you get your action back. 
Uh, there is a unique combat action you can only use at the start of the third turn, which doubles your instinct um, and lets you functionally take sort of a an extra meaty turn if combat has gone on for, for that long. And then reason affects your starting devil box. And devil bucks are the resource that you use to buy all of your specific uh, character upgrades and weapons and things like that. Yeah. Now, since you brought up devil bucks, that's a good. That's a perfect segue because on the sheet there are the devil bucks you have, and also heritage devil bucks. What would be the yep. difference between the two? Yeah, so there are some roguelite features in Deadbeats. Um, the first time you bury one of your characters, you get a few upgrades. Um, just as a like a, a survivability bonus for future characters. Uh, you can also get Heritage Devil Bucks, which are Devil Bucks that carry over from character to character. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is a system that encourages you to, if you want to, uh, play pretty fast and loose with your character. At the same time, for players who want to stick to one character, it's also fairly forgiving. Even if your character dies, there's ways to get them back. Um, and if your character doesn't die, you'll tend to earn more uh, non-heritage devil bucks than uh than like someone who's constantly mulching their character for for heritage box mm-hmm. now given that you're that you have the four um attributes that i mentioned earlier i could easily maybe i'm wrong on this but i could easily see them lean them leaning into certain fighting st- not fighting styles but certain play styles Based on which one, based on which attribute is higher than others, is yes. that is that? And if that's the case, I'd be curious what sort of play style you one would one could expect of somebody who say has higher callousness than their other stats or higher hatred than other stats, and so on. Yep. Uh, so the thing that I've actually been thrilled by in playtesting is each stat has sort of a expected build that you'd go for if you're making that stat your primary. And then each stat also has ways to completely subvert that build. So, for example, Callousness, which sets your hit points, seems like a pretty logical choice for a tank. Uh, You take an ability that lets you taunt a monster and force them to attack you. You take abilities that make your folding better, so that you can just fold whenever you're attacked and reduce the damage down to one. Uh, You take abilities that let you counterattack when you're hit, so you force every enemy to attack you, take minimal damage, and then counterpunch them really hard. Uh, Callousness makes a really strong, really traditional tank. Or you take the weapon that chips hit points off of you each time you use it, and you use that with your Callousness build and a few hit point recovery upgrades to become sort of a Blood Knight. Uh, It's a completely different approach, but it leans on that high callousness to give you survivability and to allow you to ramp up to really high damage over the course of a longer fight. Um, And that's like, that's the best thing I could have hoped for as a designer with this system. Um, I was initially worried that people would build characters in sort of flat, and expected ways and that's not necessarily bad but it doesn't it doesn't give a game a lot of staying power and that turned out not to be the case at all uh people have made some intriguingly weird builds in the playtest phase and i've done what i could to support that uh that sort of character creation mm-hmm. and uh, to, to elaborate further, we had at least one playtester who made a man who was covered in spare knives, and just he would he would taunt every attack and then uh, get hit and then stab the attacker with several of those spare knives, and it was a a perfectly viable and extremely weird uh, character building strategy. Well, I, rem- I remember those harnesses in, Ex- in Exalted that were spiked and were meant to be wrestling weapons. 
to which oh, gives yep. me the image of um <laughs> so, of someone giving you the deadliest hug ever. Yeah, uh, it was nearly like that. Uh, what was it like? Sixteenth century Siberian bear hunting armor, mm. where it's just a leather suit with a bunch of outward facing nails. Um, that was the equivalent of that build. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, it would it would appear to me that the main the main one of the main um, player facing forms of customization is through both the weapons. Which there there's some interesting ones in in the list you have here, as well as the in, as well as the um enhancements. Um. Yep. So the the mechanical parts of the character are the the stats, uh, which mostly don't change during play. Um, like you generally won't ever increase your callousness. Whatever your starting callousness is, that's your callousness for your character. Um, but your devil bucks, you can change what they're allocated to in between scenarios, so you can sort of re-tinker your build whenever you want. Um, and the things you buy with devil bucks are your weapons, your weapon upgrades, because each weapon has its own uh, sort of a la carte menu of upgrades you can apply to it. Mm -hmm. Um your utilities, which are sort of one-off effects you can trigger during combat for small bonuses, and also your outfit. And your outfit determines your basic, uh, sort of your basic stats, your starting evasion, your starting fury, um, how many times you can redraw a card during combat, how many cards you can mark in your deck, that sort of thing. Yeah, I can, I can certainly get that. Now, would it be a case where advancement is primarily handled through dev through um getting devil bucks? Yes. Yeah, one hundred percent. Your stats will basically not change, but your devil bucks and the things you've invested your devil bucks in, that changes. Um, and as you get more devil bucks, you can apply them to weapon upgrades. You can invest in a second weapon. Uh, the game actually encourages you to do that uh, because. In combat, you cannot attack back-to-back -back with most weapons. But if you have a second weapon, you can just swap between them on every attack. Yeah, and given given that, uh, would it be would it be po would it be possible for somebody to e either either through it either through a certain rule set or, or not? Um, um, create create their own create their own particular weapons with the sandbox that you have. Yes, um, the the obstacle there is that uh, my method for designing the weapons was very much sort of a yes and check process. Where I'd come up with the basic idea, I'd give the weapon some sort of play style, some sort of uh, resource to manage. And then I'd experiment with some upgrades and then run it through playtesting a bunch. So I don't have a specific like formula for producing your own weapons. But I would love to see folks doing homebrew. I'd love to see folks creating their own uh, utilities and outfits and weapons for this game. That would be really cool. Mm -hmm. I, could, I could certainly uh, see it. I did provide more support for creating monsters, though. There's a full bestiary in the book, and there's also rules for generating your own creature. At a certain point, those rules turn into... You've got to guess and check a little bit. You've got to test your creation to make sure it works. But there's there's a lot more of a mechanical foundation for making monsters. Mm -hmm. It's... I know I know that you have kind of a t kind of a um, tier setup. Um from what from what you had shared with me so because of because of that i'd like to play a little bit of a i guess i guess i guess i'll say i guess i'll say word association where i will give you Ooh. one i will give you one of the tiers and you can tell me if there's a if there's a um enemy type in in say devil may cry or in doom or or whatnot that would be an equivalent 
Oh man, uh, this is immediately turning into a, a test of my Devil May Cry knowledge. I am unfortunately not an amazing Devil May Cry player, and I do not remember clearly the name. So let me pull up a like Devil May Cry wiki <laughs> real quick. Mm -hmm. So let's start with what would what would count as a mob. Yeah, so a mob, uh, a good example would be, uh, oh, it's not sorted by picture, it's sorted by link. Man, uh, okay, so the the mobs are meant to be sort of like a, a stepping stone sort of monster. If, if they swarm, then you have a problem. Um, the wooden puppets from the first game. Oh, yeah. are, are a Mary. good example of that. Yep, uh, marionette. Mm -hmm. um, scrubs. Uh, scrubs are a bit more frustrating. Um, they have a little durability, but they're still not able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the player. Um, if we're still in the, the Devil May Cry comparison, I would say like a, like a Death Scissors, maybe. All right. Um, I'd say pro either sin or de or death, but one is just a souped up version of the other. So, um, yeah, brutes. Yeah, uh, brutes are stuff that can specifically go toe to toe with player characters, largely because of their durability. Um, unlike in Devil May Cry, the brutes tend in Deadbeats to have abilities that ramp up over the course of the match. Mm -hmm. Um, they are they are much more threatening on like round three than they are round one. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd say like a Neo Angelo or something like that would be a reasonable brute. I was gonna guess either like phantoms or um, blades. Yep. Also fair. totally fair. Um, maybe maybe unknowns if you really want to stretch it, but unknowns are a dice roll. And. Obviously, bosses would... Well, any of the bosses would really count. <laughs> yeah, yeah. By by the time you hit bosses, you've got, like, that magma spider or... Uh, oh, Phantom. Any, any... Yeah. Yeah, Phantom, um, Gri Phantom Griffin, Night Nightmare. Um, and, of course, with sewer bosses, that's pr that's pretty obvious. Yeah, that's that's your endgame threat. Yeah. Um, now, since Doom is one of the other influences, I'd like to try this again using the monster kit in Doom. Well, good news there. Um, I didn't do it intentionally, but there is a Kako Demon uh, in, in this bestiary. Um, it's because I was pulling on the same like uh, Christian mythological sources for some stuff as, as Doom was pulling on. But, well, that uh, and Doom was pulling on pulling on the art from the from the old monster manual. Oh, uh, that I didn't know. That's interesting. Yeah, it should not come as much of a surprise that a bunch of the id guys are a are a bunch of <laughs> are a, bu are a bunch of tabletop players. I mean, well, one of them was Sandy Peterson, yep. and you know his track record. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. Even if even if people get on him for some of his for some of his maps, like um. Like Sl like Slough of Despair, which I got nothing against Sandy Peterson, but Slough of Despair was probably one of the worst maps in Episode Three. <laughs> but yep, fair. The but um, a lot there was there a lot of there was a lot of influence from the designs in the D and D Monster Manual. Um, if you look at what I can't remember which version, but there was one that had a monster that looks very much like a like a brown caco demon. Just with two, just with two eyes. Oh, um, yeah. There, I don't, and I don't feel, I don't feel like digging around to see which um, version of the monster manual it was. But, and of, of course, of course, there was the whole thing of them making, um, making models and then digitally capturing them for the sprites for the actual game. But, for in that kind of situation. Shifting it to the tier setup that you have for Deadbeats. Yeah, I'm guessing... to to drop the Doom monsters into tiers, I'd say like Shotgun Zombie is a mob, 
Would you say uh, Imp is a mob? Imp, I'd say Imp is a scrub. Imp is maybe a little bit more capable. Um, uh, brute would be... Like, I actually don't pinky. remember what those floating eyes are called. Uh, yeah, a pinky. A pinky would also be a good... Uh, pick for a scrub. And as as far as the as far as the other floating eye, uh, may, maybe maybe you're thinking of pain elementals, but <laughs> nobody nobody wants uh, to deal with pain elementals. Oh, um, uh, let me see what that. Uh, oh, the Kako demon. The yeah. the floating eye is the Kako demon. Yeah. yeah. Kako. Uh, um, uh, as far as bosses, like a Hell Knight would be about equivalent to a, a Deadbeat uh, Hell Knight or boss. Um, Mancubus? Yeah, yeah. And I'm guessing Super Boss would be Archviles. Yeah, that's that's definitely the closest comparison. Yeah. Obvious, obviously, Spider Mastermind and Cyber Demon would fit as Super Bosses, but that was a little too obvious. Cons you're you're gonna see archviles more than you're gonna see the others. Where would you put, say, chain gunners, scrubs? Uh, scrub or brute, probably right on that line. Um, I I'm inclined to say more brute. Uh, depends that on whether maybe or not because you're I'm bad at doing. Um, depends on whether or not you're in the plutonia experiment or not. Yep, yep. <laughs> Where, I mean. Hit scanners, hit scanners like the chain gunner are, are a problem as it is. Plutonia just makes it worse by having multiple hit scanners at once and hiding an arch yep. while in certain combat encounters so it keeps reviving the chain gunners when you shoot them. Yep. Uh, incidentally, there are some uh, small references to Doom that are tucked mm. away in Dead Beats. Yeah. It wasn't like, it wasn't a work that I was channeling very consistently because of the differences in setting and the, the differences in tone. Um, but the rotating gristle sword weapon does have both a rip cord and a tear cord. <laughs> of, co of course. It's kind, it's kind of funny that, it, that that's become so integrated when that phrase started because of that god-awful Doom comic. I, yep. I say god-awful, but it's the best-worst kind of comic. Yeah, and that's that's sometimes what you need is something that is bad enough that it wraps back around to being satisfying. Mm -hmm. oh. Then, and I I know it's easy to pick, I know it's easy to pick on those kind of adaptations, but keep keep in mind you're dealing with an er era where people had no clue what they were doing. When yeah, they... I mean, and honestly, within. Even within the context of the modern era, I wouldn't call stuff like the Doom comic bad necessarily. Um, it's it's got a it's got a distinct vibe to it. Mm -hmm. It's it's more it's more that you, it's e when we have a lot more to work with now, it's easy to look on that kind of thing and and point and laugh. But if you're fl if you're um doing the equivalent of flying by the seat of your pants, then Th then yeah. this is the this is going to be the result, because yeah, you are, you more or less are flying by the seat of your pants in that kind of s situation because you're just told, here's here's the here's the manual make it make a comic out of this, and of course manual yeah. manual is not ha having maybe two paragraphs worth of story if you're lucky, and you, yeah, you I have to figure out how to way to a stretch that into twenty pages. Yeah, I have tremendous respect for the the people who did the written adaptations of of early uh, computer games and video games because you've got nothing to go on. You have to you have to make something that is consistent with the brand while also uh, having literally nothing to be consistent with. I'm willing to I'm willing to I'm willing to work with that to to a point. There it is a case where I'm. I'm willing to. I can be. I can be somewhat sympathetic, but I have my limits. Like you're not going to see fair. me sit here and defend Captain N, for instance. Okay, uh, valid. <laughs> like, I can try. I'm just. I'm just not going to do it. Yeah, not. Not all media ages gracefully, but I'm Although glad I, it existed. 
Yeah, I'm glad it existed. Much much in the same way that much in the same way that I'm gl I'm glad I'm not that guy when when that guy drives wrong and f and gets into a pothole. Um, oh, fair. Mel Brooks once said, "Tragedy is when I cut my finger. Comedy is when you fall into an open sewer hole and die." Yep. But uh, one one of the things I do find some, somewhat interesting is that when it comes to the upgrades, you have them all categorized, and I'm I'm guessing some of that was to uh, was to keep things a bit sane, so it's not all so it's not organized all over the place, i.e., third edition feats. <laughs> yeah. Um. One thing that may change is the current like flow and layout of the book. Uh, you've you've seen an earlier version of the draft. The version that I have is mostly the same, but there's been a couple changes since then. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, the weapon upgrades are at the very end of the equipment section. They might get moved around. I did have some requests to put them uh, under the individual weapons, and I've been going back and forth about that. It does make it easier to look at them immediately after looking at the weapon, but it also makes the weapon section like a million pages long. So I'll I'll figure out some sort of happy medium, mm -hmm. or un or unhappy medium, depending. Well, as long as it is usable by the reader without being too inconvenient, uh, then I'm. And I'm happy. Yeah. Uh, it's really tough to make sure information in an RPG is organized in a a way that is intuitive and easy to reference and makes sense when you read it in a linear fashion. Um, I I think I've done okay with the current draft, but I'll make some more updates to it as uh, as this gets deeper into the editing process. Now, on a bit of a lighter note, I gotta ask this question: What is the deal with you and Borscht lately? Oh, uh, okay. So, spur of the moment, as I was coming up with the Kickstarter campaign, um, I named a backer level Shredded Beats. Um, and I decided that, obviously, the backer level is Shredded Beats. It should come with a borscht recipe. And then in true if you give a moose a muffin fashion that one borscht recipe turned into uh, about seven beet related recipes um so currently if you back at the shredded beets level you get a recipe for a beet green salad a recipe for pickled beet stems a recipe for your own fermented beet kvass uh a borscht recipe a recipe for beet molasses and a recipe for beet molasses cookies and a recipe for a tangy beet spread that you can serve with like a like a crunchy bread. I am not an especially good cook, so testing and calibrating these recipes has been a bit of a struggle for me. Uh, that's where a lot of the borscht tweets are coming from. Um, I did make a borscht that I was very happy with yesterday, so I think I've got the recipe straightened out, and borscht is both pretty adaptable and pretty forgiving, so I don't think it'll be a bad recipe, but uh, yeah, if, if you look on social media and you see just uh, endless borscht posting from me, that's why. And I... So, the, I can I can see that, and it's... I always love, have, I always love encouraging these sorts of method to the madness things yeah it's one of the many benefits of being an indie tabletop as you can take sort of weird creative liberties like this and include six pages of recipes with your game um the the recipes will be formatted into their own uh little like mini supplement so it might turn out to be 12 pages or more. Well, we'll see. Um, but it's, I like doing, uh, I like doing world building through food and I like exploring tabletop through food. So this was sort of a fun um, addition to the project, even though it ultimately spun out of a, a pun. I can't, I can't necessarily, I can't necessarily blame you since, um, Hellas had a whole had a whole side book that was just Greek recipes. 
Oh, I'm super interested. Uh, <laughs> Hellas is great, and I would I would buy the Hellas cookbook in an instant. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously the obviously the big one is Mosca because of course you got to have that. Um, yep. I didn't. Sh- it's been a while since I looked into that book, so I didn't check if there was a recipe for y- for gyro. I would just I would just try that anyways, just to make have that as a test to see who's gonna say it right. Ah, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I have uh, I've pronounced it gyro more than a few times. I remember I remember one of my coworkers asking why do I make a big deal out of people saying it wrong, and I I said if you went into a Mexican place and asked for a tortilla, you'd get thrown the hell out. Yeah. I'm gonna order some talk OS. Uh yeah, it, that's that's valid to be a stickler for or pronunciation. Go, or go to go to a sushi place and ask for some sake. Yep. <laughs> that'd be that'd be a good way to get to get the stink eye from every chef in ear in earshot. And... Yeah, and at, at the same time, it it doesn't like it doesn't bother me at all when people pronounce stuff in weird ways, but it bothers me a lot when I pronounce stuff in weird ways. Oh, I used to I used to do riddles as a GM by um by scr- by doing by putting all of the words into a word scrambler, some and admittedly sometimes I'd put that on papers that I would that would submit for classes on April Fool's Day or submit it in mirror writing, so I can understand that. That and I like inflicting that one ta- that that na- the name of that one town in Wales on people. Oh, uh, gosh, uh, you know, Welsh pronunciation is not within my my range of capabilities at present. I love to learn it. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's there's an even worse example in um, North Island, New Zealand, which I am go- I am going to show you what the what the name of the town is. And you can try and figure out if you can pronounce that. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's a lot of letters. Um, <laughs> I could take a run at it, but we'd be here for a minute. So uh, I will I will practice that one on my own. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's... I think, that, I think there's one that's even worse that's in... Um, that's in, I think, Thailand. But I'm not, I'm not checking. Of course, the worst example is the full chemical name for T10, but that is treated as not counting. You know, because it's not it's not a word, it's chemical code. Yeah. I'm probably still valid in Scrabble though. <laughs> I I know some people who are hardcore Scrabble pl- players and every time I pull that kind of stuff they get really mad. Yeah, that's uh that's like the exodia of Scrabble. Um then then again then again um i did tell them if if i did challenge them to a game of pig latin scrabble once all right that that does sound neat it sounds exactly like what you think it is yep <laughs> you have every every word every word has to be done in pig latin or as close to pig latin as you can get Oh, that creates a a certain economic pressure on A's and Y's that I would imagine shapes the game. Yes, it also makes things go off the rails, and that was part of the plan. Yep. Oh. But with the, with that in mind, um, what are you shooting for as far as a page count? Like a hundred pages? So the current document is a hundred and ten pages. But that is pre-layout. Um, I've found that in layout stuff tends to double, so this could well be a 200-page book. Uh, there's also backer levels that allow backers to add stuff to the book. Uh, new monsters, new weapons, new upgrades, stuff like that. Um, so depending on whether backers are interested in that sort of thing, we could potentially have a bunch more pages being added. Mm-hmm. Um, the stretch goals are also 
uh, the addition of new monsters and at the very end a new adventure. So that's potentially another uh, between what uh, 20 and 70 pages that could be added. Um, so all of those will be sort of a uh, an X factor in the final length of the book. If if things go mostly to plan, probably around 200 pages. Uh, if it falls a little bit short of that, that means I did a very good job in making the layout compact. Um, and if it falls way on the other side of 200, that'll mean that people were enthusiastic about those custom backer levels, which I always like to see, but it's not like people shouldn't feel like they have to do that. Um, uh, I can, I can certainly get that. I can certainly get that. But with the, now, what would you be shooting for as far as a page, not, not a page, a um, release window? Release window is going to be as soon as possible. Um, on the Kickstarter, I set the release date as December. Um, ideally, I want to see if I can get it to release in the summer, but the, uh, the factors that will affect that will be um, the length of the editing and playtesting process, because there's some playtesting that's going to have to be done after the Kickstarter finishes when the backer content is added. Mm -hmm. um, and I've I've got systems in place to run through that playtesting really quick, but it'll still take a little bit of time. Um, after the playtesting and editing are done, the next biggest delay will be print proofing. Um, I've gotten very good at submitting things to drive through RPG um, and having them come out right the first time. But there's always a chance that I submit the book, it comes back, there's a weird error. I resubmit it, it comes back again, there's another weird error. And all of these with like a multiple week long mailing delay. So if some funkiness occurs during the print proofing stage, that could take uh, a very fast turnaround time and turn it into a moderately long turnaround time. I don't think the project will take longer to deliver than December. Um, if, if it does, that will mean that some element uh, was just way more difficult than I calculated. And I don't think that's the case. I've I've done delivery on some RPG Kickstarters before. I've got a pretty good sense of them. Mm -hmm. And well, you know the only way to get into Carnegie Hall, right? Practice. Uh yeah. I was gonna say break in, but yes, practice. Oh, that's it's a much better, uh, much better approach. Yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to say so. I don't, I don't feel like, I don't feel like spending that amount of time in a New York prison. Yeah. I mean, if, if they let me work on RPGs while I was in there, it's not too bad. <laughs> but with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. No problem. Thank you for hosting me again. Yep. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say I appreciate around here, it. drinking is not mandatory. But it is encouraged. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay... Fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>